Hey friends, Miss Susan here. We are back to read chapters three and four of George Brown Class Clown Trouble Magnet by Nancy Krulik. And if you'll make sure that you read chapters one and two first, there's a video for that one too. Um, we read in chapters one and two that George was a new student at his school, but he has this problem and he doesn't know how to stop it. He has this issue where he burps, but when he burps, it is magical and it makes him do funny things, um, put straws in his nose, juggle things, ride a skateboard in the classroom. And it's funny to the kids, but it's not funny to his teacher and the other adults that are around. So um, in the last video, we read that he did let a little burp escape. He tried not to, he tried to hold it in, but uh, a little bit escaped, um, but not all of it. So we're going to um, keep reading and see here what happens in chapters three and four. Now, as we're reading, keep in mind those words that we were talking about in the last video in, per in the first chapters. We are making sure that we're paying attention to who the characters are, the setting, where and when the story is taking place, the plot, which means the events in the story, everything that happens. We're paying attention to the conflict or the problem, right? Every story has to have a problem or else it's not much of a story, right? And we're paying attention to the theme. What does the author want us to get from reading this story? Now, I'm thinking as far as our author's purpose goes, this is probably a book to entertain us, don't you think? Yeah, I think Nancy Krulik said, I just want to make them laugh, you know, but there's usually a theme to go along with it too. Uh, maybe it's be kind or trust your instincts or work hard. So we are paying attention to the theme in this book too. So pay attention to those five basic elements um, of our reading today, okay? We're going to start with chapter three, and that's where we saw the posters of the uh, the meatloaf and the eat five vegetables a day. And um, so we think we're thinking we're in the cafeteria now. Let's read on to find out. Chapter three. George saw the sign the minute he and the other fourth graders walked into the cafeteria at lunchtime. Cool. George said, a talent show. I painted the poster, his friend Chris said. Now keep in mind, we still have lots of these bold words that the author wants us to pay attention to. So Nancy Krulik, the author who wrote the words, she must be thinking, I really want my readers to remember those words, right? Because they're darker than the other ones. Who's the creepy looking lady on it? George asked. That's supposed to be Edith B. Sugarman. Chris told him. Then he asked, so are you going to sign up for the talent show? George shrugged. I guess. You're not going to skateboard again, are you, George? Louie said really loudly so everyone would hear. Mike and Max, who were like Louie's shadows, started to laugh. George made a face. Skateboarding in the school hallway hadn't been his fault, but of course he couldn't tell Louie that. Louie would never believe there was such a thing as a magic super burp. Who would? Maybe we could be superheroes, Chris suggested to George and Alex. I could be Spider-Man. Alex could be Superman. And George, you could be Batman. Chris had more superhero comic books than anybody George had ever known. He was even writing his own comic book about a superhero he'd made up. Toilet Man. What will we do as superheroes? Alex asked. Just stand on stage in old Halloween costumes? We could attach ourselves to wires and some of the other kids could pull us up into the air, Chris told him. That would be really cool. George wasn't so sure. What if the wires broke? No way George wanted to go from Batman to Splatman in front of the whole school. George sat down at the lunch table. Chris and Alex sat on either side of him. What did your mom pack today? Alex asked George. George peeked into his lunch bag. A bologna sandwich, he said. 
and a banana. I got ham and cheese, Chris said, and a bag of peanuts. I have egg salad, Alex told the boys. Anyone want to trade? George and Chris shook their heads. I know, egg salad is the worst, Alex admitted, sniffling his sandwich. Oh, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. Let me back up because good readers always back up when they need to. That didn't make sense, right? So I'm going to back up. I know egg salad is the worst, Alex admitted, sniffing his sandwich. It kind of smells like the bathroom after my dad's been in there a long time. George and Chris laughed. They knew exactly what he meant. George looked down at the, his bologna sandwich. For a minute, he thought about poking holes in two bologna slices and putting them over his face like a mask. That would totally crack Chris and Alex up. Chris would probably call George a bologna man or something. But as George peeled off the bologna slices, he caught a glimpse of the cafeteria lady. She was staring right at him. Do you think she liked what he did with the bologna slices? Probably not, huh? Look at her face. She doesn't look happy. What do you think she's going to do? Let's find out. Cafeteria ladies definitely didn't like masks made out of bologna slices. They took food really seriously. Besides, bologna masks were something the old George would make. The new and improved George didn't play with his food, so George closed his sandwich up again and took a bite. There's a game of killer ball going on, Alex said as he, Chris, and George went out to the schoolyard for recess. You guys want to play? Killer ball was a game Louie had invented. It was kind of like dodgeball. We always lose, Chris said. Because we're never on Louie's team, Alex told him. The boys watched as Louie clobbered Juliana on the back with a soccer ball. Ouch, Juliana shouted. You didn't have to throw it so hard. See, Alex said. Chris popped some of his peanuts into his mouth. Just then, two chattering squirrels ran right past the boys and up a tree. George was about to suggest that they throw the squirrels a few peanuts. But before he could even open his mouth, he felt a strange bubbling in the bottom of his belly. Maybe it was the bologna sandwich. Or maybe it wasn't. Oh man, not again. George tried desperately to stop the bubbles. He held his nose and clamped his mouth shut. George, what are you doing? Chris asked him. George didn't answer. He was afraid to talk. Those bubbles were strong. George had already kept one inside today, but this one seemed determined to get out. The bubbles ping pong pinged their way up out of George's stomach. They boing bing boinged their way to his chest. They bing boing binged their way up his throat and then... <laughs> George let out a supersonic burp. It was so loud it made the leaves on the trees shake. Kids clear across the playground could hear it. Whoa! Alex exclaimed. Impressive! Chris added. George opened his mouth and tried to say, excuse me, but those weren't the words that came out. Instead, he said, you know how to catch a squirrel? You climb a tree and act like a nut. And with that, George's feet started running toward the nearest tree. George tried to make his legs go stiff so they couldn't climb. He hugged the trunk of the tree and tried to stay on the ground, but his arms and legs had their own ideas. They wanted to climb that tree. And the next thing he knew, that's exactly what George was doing. George Brown, get down from there, Mrs. Kelly called out. You'll hurt yourself. George wanted to get down. He really did, but his feet wouldn't let him. Up, up, up he climbed. Squeak, squeak. George chattered to a squirrel on a branch, but the squirrel didn't understand George's squirrel speak. It scampered away as fast as it could. George's cheeks wanted to have a little squirrely fun. They sucked in a lot of air and blew themselves up like a big balloon. Now George looked like a squirrel storing nuts in his cheeks. Sort of, anyway. Is he trying to catch a squirrel? George heard Chris ask. 
He's definitely acting nutty, Alex agreed. They were both laughing really hard. By now, the principal, Mrs. McKeon, had come out onto the playground. George Brown, there is no climbing trees during recess, she called up to him. You know that. George did know that. Unfortunately, the super burp didn't, and neither did his hands. They weren't about to let his cheeks have all the fun. But before George knew what was happening, his fists were drumming on his chest. Ah! George let out a yell. He was no ordinary squirrel. He was a Tarzan squirrel. George, Mrs. McKeon shouted angrily, get down this minute. Ah! George shouted even louder. His arms reached out toward a long, thin branch. His feet got, got ready to push off so he could swing to the next tree. Whoosh! Suddenly, George felt something pop in his stomach. It was like someone had punctured a balloon. All the air rushed out of him. The super burp was gone. But George was still up in the tree. George looked down at the ground. Whoa, he was really high up. He grabbed the tree trunk and held on tight. Get down from there right now, young man, Mrs. McKeon shouted. Yes, ma'am, George said. Slowly, he began to climb down the tree. Mrs. McKeon and Mrs. Kelly were both waiting for George when he reached the ground. I'm so disappointed, George, Mrs. Kelly said. She straightened her glasses and wiped the little beads of sweat from under her nose. You know the recess rules. What got into you, Mrs. McKeon asked him. George frowned. It wasn't what got into him that made him act crazy, act so crazy. It was what slipped out of him. That super burp was really bad. Um, I don't know, ma'am, George said. He looked down at the ground. I suggest you save your squirrel act for the talent show, Mrs. McKeon told him. You know the way to my office. Now march. George sighed and followed the principal. Another recess sitting in the gray metal chair that made your butt fall asleep. Another recess sitting listening to Mrs. McKeon's pen scratching against the papers on her desk. Another recess staring out the window while the other kids got to play. Chapter four. They look happy in this picture. Looks kind of like they're running. What do you think might happen in this story? Do you think they might run from something? Let's read to find out. Chapter four. I'm going to act out a scene from my comic book, Chris said, as he, Alex, and George walked to school the next morning. My mom said I can use an old toilet plunger and a toilet seat for my sword and shield. Cool, George said. I'm signing up to work backstage, Alex said. I don't have any talent, at least not the kind you perform in a talent show. George understood what his friend meant. Alex was good at math and science. But you couldn't stand up in front of an audience and do long division. Working backstage wasn't such a bad idea. Teachers really liked when you helped out with things like that. Maybe if he did that, Mrs. Kelly might forgive him for recess yesterday. Maybe I'll work backstage with you, George told Alex. Awesome, Alex said. They need a lot of help with the curtains and lights and stuff. George didn't want to just work backstage. He did have some talent show talents. He wanted to do an act, too. He just didn't know what kind. Not yet. All morning, George couldn't help thinking about the talent show. While the class was working on their grammar worksheets, George pictured himself singing to the crowd. Unfortunately, George wasn't a great singer. And a minute later, he pictured the crowd throwing squishy tomatoes at his head. During math, which while part of his brain was busy working on multiplication problems, the other part was thinking about a stand-up comedy routine. He knew a lot of really funny jokes, like the one he emailed last night to his old friend Kevin back in Cherrydale. How can you tell if an elephant's been in your refrigerator? You find his footprint in the peanut butter. George laughed quietly at his own joke, but apparently not quite quietly enough. 
George, Mrs. Kelly scolded. Can you tell me what's so funny about this math problem? N -n -n nothing, George said. I'm going to read this poem called Casey at the Bat, Julie Juliana said at lunch. It's all about this amazing baseball player. Well, he's amazing until the end of the poem anyway. Then he strikes out. Ariella, Tess, Molly, and I are rehearsing our dance after school today, Sage said. We have the music picked out already. It's called The Four Seasons. What are you, what are we going to do, Louie? Max asked. Louie looked at him. We're going to start a band and the talent show will be our first gig, he said. I'm on guitar and Mike's on drums. Max frowned. I don't play anything, he said. How am I supposed to be in the band? Louie thought about that for a minute. Finally, he said, you can be the roadie. Cool, Max said. Then he stopped and gave Louie a confused look. What's a roadie? He asked. A roadie is the guy who sets up equipment, George told him. He also gets the sandwiches and sodas and stuff. Louie shot George a look that said, who asked you? I can play stuff, George told Louie, Mike, and Max. At my old school, I learned to play tuba and Louie burst out laughing. <laughs> tuba? He asked, are you kidding? Who would have heard of a tuba in a rock band? Not me, Mike and Max said at the same time. Let me finish, George said. I also play keyboard. I was in a rock band at my old school. We were Slinky and the Worms. That's a dumb name, Louis said. Look, maybe I could play keyboard for you, George told him. Alex and Chris were looking at George as if he were out of his mind. He could practically hear them thinking, why would George want to play in a band with Louie? George was sort of asking himself the same question, but Louie was starting a band. And even though George could have played keyboard on his own during the talent show, that wouldn't be as cool as being in a band. Besides, playing alone meant everybody in the audience could tell when you made a mistake. In a band, it was much harder to figure out who was messing up. Louie looked at him strangely. Why would I want you on keyboard? He asked. Because guitar and drums don't make much of a band, George explained. It was hard for Louie to argue, that, argue with that. Well, how do I know you can play? He asked finally. Yeah, you could be making this whole Slinky the Worm thing up, Max added. Slinky and the worms, George corrected him. And I'm not making it up. Prove it, Louis said. Come to my house, then I'll decide if you're good enough to be in the band. Anytime you want, George replied. Louis stood up. Okay, I'm done eating, Louis said, pushing his tray away. Time for some killer ball. I'm done too, Mike said. Me three, Max agreed. Louis, Max, and Mike started to walk out of the cafeteria, but before they did, Louis turned around. Oh, and one more thing, he told George. I'm lead singer. Suddenly, George felt a little bubble brewing up inside, kind of like he was going to burp. He opened his mouth to say, okay, but out came a little burp. And then he said, you should sing solo. Solo, no one can hear you. Chris and Alex started to laugh. <laughs> what did you say? Louis asked. George didn't answer. That had been a mini magic burp. The next one might be a whopper. He said that he thought so, Chris told Louis. I heard him. Yeah, that's what I figured, he said, Louis said. But he didn't sound like he really believed it. George shot Chris a closed mouth smile, but he didn't say anything. He was afraid to open his mouth. When Louie was gone, Chris asked, how come you want to be in Louie's band? Being a band in a band is cool, George said. Yeah, I guess, Alex agreed. If I could play guitar, I'd be in a band. It, it, would, be great, it would have been great to be in a band with Chris and Alex, but since that wasn't going to happen, George would have to settle for being in Louie's band. George watched through the cafeteria window, Louie really nailed a third grader in Killer Ball. Gulp. What if Louie played just as hard at Killer Band?
All right. And that's the end of chapters three and four. So let's talk for a minute. Let's look back through the pages. Who were our characters? We have this, this group that's formed, right? Louis, Max, and Mike. And how would you describe those characters? Are they nice and kind? No, they don't sound like it, do they? Are they maybe bullies? Yeah, kind of being mean to other kids. So we have this mean group here. Yeah. And then you have George and his friend Alex and Chris. And that there's they're the three kind of nice people, right? So we have two different groups going on here. And where were they when uh when the sto- this part of the story was taking place? Do you remember where they were? Let's take a look back at the the pictures. This is where he was thinking about tomatoes being splatted his face at the talent show. He wasn't really at the talent show. So he was, that's where he was climbing in a tree. So we could say they were outside during the, these two chapters. They were outside. And where else were, were they? In the cafeteria, right? So they were outside and in the cafeteria, and that's the setting. That's where it happened. The when of when it happened, the setting might be hmm, during the day. I think we can go again with during the day. It's still happening during the school day. So we would say our setting is during the day or or during the school day. And the location or the place where they are is outside outside and in the cafeteria. So what happened in that part of the plot of our story? Remember, the plot is the events, the things that happen in the story, the things the characters do. So you're going to hear a lot of action words or verbs when you're talking about uh, the events. So first, what happened was George turned into a squirrel, sort of, didn't he? He was being funny in the in the cafeteria. That led him to burp. And he was pretending to be a squirrel. And then in the cafeteria, they're talking about the talent show, aren't they? And Louis agrees to let George try out for his band to be in the talent show with them. So those are some key events that happen in our plot. A plot is all of the little teeny tiny events that add up to make the entire story. All right. And any theme? Did you see any theme going on in there? How about a conflict? I'm not sure about a theme. Maybe you can think of one. Conflict, I think, would be, look at these faces right here. These guys kind of look like they're arguing, don't they? So there's a little bit of conflict here. Louis says he's going to have a have a band and George wants to be in it. So Louis is thinking about letting him join the band. He's going to at least let him try out. So I think the conflict in this part of the story was kind of two things. One small thing was George misbehaved when he burped. You know, he had that magical burp and he acted like a squirrel. Uh, The principal and the teacher didn't like that, did they? And two, he gets into this little argument, this little tiff with Louie, and they decide that George will try out for the band. All right. So I would love to hear if you guys think of any themes for those chapters three and four. Feel free to email us if you want to. Let me know what you think. Uh, the cha- the theme for chapters three and four are, and we will be back soon to read chapters five and six. Let's make a prediction. What do you think, according to the picture, might happen in chapter five? I see some kids in a classroom. I see the teacher. I see a picture of our country, the United States of America. What do you think might happen in our story? We will get together soon again and uh, read chapters five and six of Trouble Magnet. But in the meantime, go ahead and give me a thumbs up and subscribe so you know when the next chapters are read. And uh, I hope to see you soon. Thanks for watching. Take care of you.